Send it back to Santa. A magic bell has he. He pulls it tight with all his heart. And a mighty Santa he'll be. What the fuck was that? These videos are not for children. If you are a children, then piss off. This channel. Hey there, I'm Vin Fuso. And how about Hanna Barbera? You know, the great cartoon juggernaut. I mean, they gave us such classics as the Flintstones, the Smurfs, Tom and Jerry, Scooby Doo, <gasps> the Jetsons, Johnny Quest, Yogi Bear, Quick Draw McGraw, McGilla Gorilla, Huckleberry Hound, and many, many more. Yes, there's no doubt that Hanna-Barbera will forever go down as one of the most influential and iconic animation studios in the history of cartoons. However, did you know that Hanna-Barbera also made some of the most strange adaptations when they were handed the rights to others' source material? I mean, don't get me wrong, it wasn't all bad. They had some successful attempts when recreating the Fantastic Four, the Justice League, which they renamed the Super Friends, and the Bearstain Bears. Or the Bearstein Bears, depending on which universe you are originally from, of course. But man, sometimes they would just get some previously established content and just completely paint over it. Like I'm about to demonstrate right now. You all know Godzilla, right? Giant lizard packed with atomic breath and a natural knack for complete destruction of Japanese cities? The myth, the monster, the sometimes hero, I guess? Of course you do, who doesn't? But did you know he had a nephew named Gazuki? No. Of course you didn't! And you were better off not knowing that. So you're welcome for the soul-crushing trauma. No, you didn't mishear me. Godzilla has a kid nephew. Which is news to me because I wasn't even aware he had a sister. Though to be fair, I'm not gonna sit here and act like I'm some kinda... Uh, I'm some kinda Godzilla aficionado. Hell, my first encounter with Godzilla was the American remake. The Matthew Broderick one. That's a lot of fish. But in Hanna-Barbera's Godzilla, Godzuki is the most absolutely useless comedic foil I have ever seen in my life. I mean, come on, he doesn't even look like something from Gojira. He looks like he was a Scrap Dragon Tales character. He looks like Baby Bob's long lost brother. Bruh, look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm supposed to believe this little dweeb shares the same gene pool as the City Destroyer? No doubt that this is what would later inspire Japanese movies to create Manila, the sun of Godzilla, who, like Godzuki, sucked and couldn't do shit. Unlike the Hanna-Barbera cartoon, Godzilla responds by smacking the kid around a little. Ah uh, yes, the good old days. When the only parenting you needed was a good knock on the ass to solve all your children's problems. Got ADHD? Just give the kid a couple wonks in the head, they'll learn to sit still. What's that? Illiterate? Well, you'll learn to read after I throw this textbook at your face. Those were the days. You sound like you yearn for those days. No, I'm just saying those were the days. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Another great example, and, and I can't really even fully wreck my, my brain around this one, The Pink Panther. The Pink Panther was a pretty popular movie series about a comedically inept detective played, of course, by Peter Sellers. And it's a series I'd really like to get the chance to sit down and watch. Because of this channel, I might be able to at some point in time. Almost every installment in that franchise began and closed out on the series mascot, a cartoon Pink Panther. And that's it. That's the only significance this character has to those well-established and beloved films. And yet these minor appearances were somehow enough to catapult him into stardom. All of a sudden there's, there's this Pink Panther merchandise, there's Pink Panther video games, there's Pink Panther TV shows, Pink Panther commercials, Pink Panther... Pink Panthers! And all of them have nothing to do with the movie and everything to do with this guy. Because clearly, 
He was the breakout star of those movies. But I can't blame Hanna-Barbera for all of that. Because that's actually not their fault. That was a completely different animation studio that decided to make the Pink Panther... something. However, what I can blame Hanna-Barbera for is their sequel series, Pink Panther and Sons. The Panther Sons, the youngest named Panky, the oldest thankfully not named Hanky, are part of a team called the Rainbow Panthers. Which, if I'm being honest, really just sounds like the LGBTQ community's answer to the Black Panthers. Together, they... You know what, I'll, I'll just read the synopsis of the series here. <clears throat> the series centers on the Pink Panther's two sons, Preteen Pinky, his brother, Toddler Panky and their friends in the Rainbow Panther's crew, the Pretty Chatta, Fighting Rocco, Gibberish Talking Murphle, Overalls Wearing Annie, and Mixed Up Talking Pumpkin. Each episode shows the Rainbow Panthers coming together for friendship and fun as they learn all about growing up and caring for each other as they take on a group of lions called the Howl Angels. Group of lions called the Howl Angels. Wait a second, that, that doesn't make any goddamn sense. If they were wolves, I guess you could call them the Howl Gro When do lions howl? I, I mean, what happened? Did you just not have any access to the Discovery Channel at the time? I, I don't know. <laughs> But outside of that, could you make any sense out of what I just said? Because I can't. And sitting here watching the episodes ain't helping either. Oh, and here's the kicker. Here's the best part. Here's a good one. The Pink Panther? You know, the, the titular character in Pink Panther and Sons? Nowhere to be seen for most of the episode's runtime. Like in the movies, he only shows up at the end of each show. So the show somehow has even less to do with the Pink Panther than the original animated series had to do with the Pink Panther movies. I, I just gotta ask, was the name value of this voiceless, empty personality, overgrown pink cat creature really worth it? The whole series just could have been about Pinky and Panky. Didn't even, didn't even need to acknowledge who their father was. There is somehow less reason for the show to connect with the original Pink Panther cartoon than there is for the cartoon to connect with the original Pink Panther movies. I am angry! Oh god, I, I, I think I'm having a brain aneurysm. And next up, I give you Fred and Barney Meet the Thing. Now, uh, on name alone, you're probably thinking, wait a second, you mean to tell me Hanna-Barbera is remaking John Carpenter's masterpiece? Well, I guess it's not as bad as the remake I saw of it back in 2011. Disappointingly, no. This is actually just the thing from the Fantastic Four, in a crossover with the Flintstones. Except, despite what the title of the show may have you believe, Fred and Barney don't actually ever meet the thing. As a matter of fact, it's not even set in the same continuity. Instead, this was basically a Flintstones episode, followed by a Thing episode, or, or vice versa, I can't really remember. This was something that Hanna-Barbera did quite often. Hence why the Pac-Man Little Rascals Richie Rich Hour was actually a thing. That's, that's a team up I, 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 I would not care to see. Now, if we completely disregard the Flintstones, as they really don't have all that much to do with this, we're left with a very, 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 <gasps> very, 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 very loose adaptation of one character out of an ensemble cast. This show is the animated equivalent to when they spun Joey off from Friends. It just, it doesn't work. He's part of a team. He works with a team on his own. Not so great. The thing just isn't all that interesting on his own. No offense to him. But I can't really imagine Marvel Studios making a Thing movie. I mean, actually, at this rate, I can't even imagine them making a Fantastic Four movie. Being that there is no Fantastic Four in this continuity, there is obviously no accident which mutated him. He's also not even an adult in this version of events. He's a teenager. Which is somehow only slightly worse than the time that Marvel decided to make Iron Man a teenager. Or the time they decided to turn the Punisher black. Or the time they decided to turn the Punisher into Frankenstein. Or the time they made Captain America a werewolf. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that looks good, that looks great. That's a really good for Sony. You, you, you should be proud of yourself. Anyway, in reimagining the thing, Hanna-Barbera decided to basically just rip off Shazam. Little Benji Grimm, and yes, that is what he's called in the series, Benji Grimm, was basically a normal human child who had a ring that would change him into the thing we all know and are kind of lukewarm on. And all he had to do was hold it up and say, Thing ring, do your thing! See now, I said they ripped off Shazam, and they kind of did. 
when it comes to the concept. But outside of that, it was kind of just a rehash of Scooby-Doo. Little Benji Grimm would, would be out solving mysteries with his friends and whatnot. It's just, it, it, it's... It's, it's been done. Which really should surprise no one, because Hanna-Barbera kind of just copy and pasted a lot of their ideas. Especially if those ideas were Scooby-Doo. See, there's recycling a concept, and then there's just not knowing how to move on. Hanna-Barbera for a while pretty much exclusively put out shows that played out like Scooby-Doo tribute shows. Hanna-Barbera also tried their hand at following up the Partridge Family. You know, the show from the 70s about an oversized white family that bonds together through music. No, 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 I, I mean the other 70s show about an oversized white family that bonds together through music. Yeah, there we are, that's the one. The Partridge Family, or as I used to know them, the Discount Brady Bunch, no offense, they were still good in their own way. It's just that their own way was somebody else's. The Partridge Family cartoon series was titled Partridge Family 22,000 AD. Or as people commonly referred to it as, The Partridge Family in Outer Space. Or, as I commonly refer to it as, The Jetsons. You know, I'm sick of this family, okay? For first it's the Brady Bunch, now they want to rip off the Jetsons. I, I just, I can't keep the biters. I, I don't want anything to do with this. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how to describe this. It's literally just the Jetsons minus the Jetsons. There was no rhyme and reason for this either. It, it's not like there's an in-universe explanation for why they went from the 70s to 22 AD in outer space. By the way, why do shows do that? Why, 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 why does media do that? Like, like, if you go to the future, you gotta be in space. Like, in the future, why can't we just be in the future on the same planet? I don't, I don't get it. It upsets me. And when I don't understand something, I get unreasonably angry. This is first grade math all over again. All right, let me just collect myself here. Okay, so I, I, I have several questions. One, is this a follow-up to the original series or is it a reboot? I don't know. I really don't. I, just, I genuinely do not know. And you know what? I don't think the people making this show even knew. The show also includes a robot dog, though surprisingly he doesn't speak or solve mysteries. So, you know, really, what's even the point? But hey, at least it had Danny Bonaducci. And really, you know what? That's all you can ask for. Side note, I just found out that they actually got the original actress to come back and play Lori Partridge. But she dropped out after only two episodes into production and had to be replaced. She basically said, hey, listen, you could, you could take this show to outer space, but this ain't going to be my final frontier. And now I want to talk to you guys about the Gary Coleman show. The Gary Coleman show. Now, with every other show I've mentioned, they were based on previously established source material. Typically TV shows. But this isn't Different Strokes, the animated series. This is the Gary Coleman show. I'm sorry for the repetition here, but, but I still, I, I, I gotta keep doing it because I can't even bring myself to believe this. So now you may be wondering, what exactly does a cartoon show about Gary Coleman entail? Is it a day in the life of the miniature actor? Well, no. Because like the Cosby Show, the name of this show is a goddamn lie. How are you gonna call the show The Cosby Show and have it centered around the Huxtables? And hey, don't think I don't see you, Steve Harvey. The Harvey Show? Your name was Steve Hightower. Why is the show even called Eve if Eve isn't playing someone named Eve in the show? This shit keeps me up at night. Clearly, I had way too much access to UPN as a child. Anyway, the show isn't actually about Gary Coleman. Who'd you talk about? It's about a guy who just so happens to look, sound, and act identical to Gary Coleman. And not even so much a guy, but a kid. And not even so much a kid, but an angel. You see, Gary Coleman plays Andy LeBue, an angel sent down to Earth to help others so this way he can finally earn his wings. Now, if that plot sounds a little familiar to you, it might be because you've seen It's a Wonderful Life. I know I was getting that vibe from watching it. It's classic. Love it. Or it might be because despite its name and appearance, this is actually a spinoff. You see, Gary Coleman actually starred in a made-for-TV movie called The Kid with a Broken Halo. It was a blink and you miss it movie, and honestly, y you probably blinked. And it probably aired less than a handful of times, and nobody really remembered it anyway. But, somehow, someway, it warranted an animated series. And Hanna-Barbera, in their infinite wisdom, decided to name it The Gary Coleman Show. I can only imagine that this was a That 70s Show situation, where producers figured, eh, you know, everyone's just gonna call it The Gary Coleman Show anyway, so screw it, let's just, let's just go with it. Gary Coleman Show it is. And shocker, this show is almost nothing like the made-for-TV movie. And not only did it not include any of the characters in that made-for-TV movie outside of Arnold, but it also added in Hornswoggle, 
who looks considerably different from his WWE days. And to close this video off, I'm gonna reveal to you what I believe is the most bizarre, backward ass, bullshit, bad shit buffoonery that is a Hanna-Barbera attempt at retelling someone else's story. Fonz and the Happy Day Gang. Fonz and the Happy Day Gang is probably exactly what you'd expect. It's a show about the gang from the Happy Day days, with Fonzie being front and center. However, this show is also probably the exact opposite of whatever you'd expect, because Hanna-Barbera went in another direction. Before I start, I just want to make sure everyone knows what Happy Days was. I mean, it was way before my time, and I'm an old man now. So allow me to elaborate. It was a show about Richie Cunningham and his family, and his best friend who was a high school dropout, who wore a leather jacket everywhere. What would you like to say to the people of the 21st century, huh? E and it was also the show that coined the phrase, Jumping the Shark. And boy oh boy, did good old HB take that one step further. If Happy Days jumped the shark, Fonz and the Happy Days gang fucking flew over the shark blindfolded. Despite some occasionally out there stories, Happy Days for the most part was grounded in some form of reality. Well, I guess, you know, outside of Robin Williams showing up as an alien for one episode and four seasons of a spinoff. Oh yeah, and then there was that one episode where Fonzie hooks up with a ghost. Yeah, I remember that because that shit freaked me out. But outside of all of that, it was pretty much normal. Pretty much. Now, in contrast, if you were to go to Wikipedia, this would be the first lines you'd read on the spinoff. The Fonz and the Happy Days Gang is an American animated science fiction comedy A SCIENCE FICTION COMEDY SERIES?! What fucking show was I watching on TV land? And if I scroll down just a wee bit, the series focuses on Fonzie joined by an anthropomorphic dog named Mr. Cool. I'm gonna be real with you, I'm straight up not having a good time right now. I'm honestly already to call quits on this video, on this channel, on this platform, in this life. I I'm just, I'm done. I'm packing my shit up now. But oh no, wait, because it gets worse. His friends are visited by Cupcake, a girl from the future who pilots a malfunctioning time machine. I think I could physically, I think I could physically feel myself getting dumber for having to have read that. So basically, long story short, they accidentally break Bill and Ted's phone booth and crash through various different points and places in time, all while trying to desperately get back to the 1960s. And here's what really drives me wild, is that not only, not only do they go through different time periods, they also go in and out of fact and fiction. The same show that introduces the Happy Days gang to Julius Maximus has them running into the Three Musketeers and Medusa. No, no, not, not, not that one. The show even ends with them meeting Sherlock Holmes. Oh good, maybe he can solve the mystery as to why this sucks. I think what makes this even worse is that they actually convinced Henry Winkler, Ron Howard, and Ralph Mouth to come back and voice their characters. Which gives this whole show a little bit more credibility. Is this really what you want to sign off on? Is, is this really what you choose to endorse? I mean, hey, sure, make your money, but, but at what cost? Your legacy? So, I, I guess now's a good time as ever to close it out. So those were just some of Hanna-Barbera's most outrageous or otherwise strange concepts for TV shows. I know there's more. There's actually a lot more. I, I have a list already. But you know me, I always like leaving the door open for a sequel. So contributing degenerates, let me know in the comment section below if you'd want another video taking a look back at some of HB's strange sequel series, or overall complete reimaginings, of classic content. I'm the Clown Prince of Crime, and that was the Prince of Personality, the Infuso, or so he says. So if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole and you too want to become a V-tard, don't forget to like and subscribe. Follow the man on Twitter, because it's not stalking if it's on the internet after all. <laughs> Join the fun by joining the Discord. If for some strange reason you want to show support, and I don't know why you would, and if you have a dollar to spare, head over to the SIJW's Patreon, where you can request videos, get exclusive content, and early access to scheduled videos. Or head to his PayPal, where you can buy the shirts. Oh, aren't those lovely? And just remember, if you're not tuning in, you're missing out. Yeah, yeah. Ah! <laughs>